W5FC. Dallas Racy's Net, first and third Sunday, 8 p.m., W5FC.
Chairman, I need to make myself very clear. If we uplink now, Skynet will be in control of your military. But you'll be in control of Skynet, right? That is correct, sir. Skynet. November Tango 5, Tango Mike, Tony in East Dallas, full power. Delta, Guy in Forney, Midpower. Okay, I, I detect mission creep. That's okay. Let me get these four. I got WP4 MFI, Ted in Dallas, Lopar. W5 QS Gus, far, far northeast Dallas, with a long pause, low power. NT5 TM, Tony in. Dallas, Sneaky said medium power, and K1 GBD, guy over 40, also medium power. Uh, anyone else 
12 power short time, Mike, to check in. Uh, that's our first round. Kilo India 5, Sierra X-Ray Echo, Brandon, Wiley, Texas. Okay, there was a double there, but I got KI-5 SXE, that's Brandon over in Wiley. Any of you here, I think, full power short time, folks, do you have anything you would like to bring to the net now before your signal fades into the sunset? Please come on your call. Okay, well, very good. We'll go to regular check-ins. That doesn't mean that the previous check-ins were irregular, although I have a suspicion they were. Uh, regular check-ins, if you'd like to join us over here, please come now with your call sign phonetically, your name, and where you're transmitting from. November 5, Bravo, Bravo. Bill and Irving. This is Alpha Call 5, Papa Mike, Rich in Rockwall, AG5 PM. Kilo, Foxtrot 5, Zulu, Bravo, Lima, Bill, Farmer's Branch. This is Kilo India 5, Sierra Zulu Bravo Max Poetry Ranch. This is Alpha Alpha 5, Alpha Hotel Robert and Richardson. Whiskey Bravo 5, Oscar Zulu Lima, Brenda and DeSoto. Kilo, Foxtrot 5, Juliet Hotel Alpha, Chaz, Low Energy, Mesquite. Okay, we'll pull those in. I've got N5BB, Mr. Bill Irving. I've got AG5PM, Rich Rockwell. i got KF5ZDL, Mr. Bill, another one. Farmer's Branch. You guys are supposed to check in together because your bills, but that's okay. Okay, I have S Z F B. That's Max and Poetry Ranch. Welcome, Max. I think it's the first time you've checked in. Just to let us know where Poetry Ranch is. A A five G H. That's Robert Richardson. W B five O Z L. Miss Brenda DeSoto. K F five J H A. Chaz from. We're never sure where Chaz is from, but wherever it is, there's high energy or dark matter, one or the other. I'll take additional check-ins. If you'd like to join us, please come to your call sign phonetically, your name, and where you're transmitting from. All right, we will go over to Echo Lake and... and uh, uh, Kelly says that uh, it's out near her, and she's in Quinlan. So let's go ahead and take check-ins on Echolink. I'll give you extra time. Echolink only, please come now. India 5, Gulf Romeo Hotel, Melissa, Northeast Dallas. Yeah. 
is Kilo 5, Kilo Tango X-Ray, Kelly, in Quinlan. Foxtrot 5, Papa Delta Sierra, Billy and Sherman on Echo Link. Golf 5, Bravo Zulu Whiskey, J near Weber. of about 22 this year, uh, break. The applicants perform 120 to 150 hours of original research along um, a, a NASA subject matter expert in one of the topics of galaxy classification, spectroscopy, environmental studies, climate research, or mission design, break. And these, these students are uh, rising uh, juniors, 11th graders, from all across the country, and they are just absolutely incredible. Uh, all of them have, uh, you know, top 10 of their classes, athletes, musicians, scholars, and inventors. So our future is in good hands. KI5, Sierra Z, Bravo. Back to the net. Some interest in this. 
Yes, Tom, I PM'd the whole thing to you uh, earlier tonight. I said uh, on the uh, Facebook post that I would PM you, and I PM'd all that information to you. All right, very good. I'll, uh, I'll check it, and I'll repost it over on the uh, Skynet page. How's that? Sounds great. And uh, incidentally, last year I found an anomaly in the data that a lot of these students had not uh, had support uh, in their astronomy research before they got into the SEAS program. And uh, I wrote an article that appeared in the September uh, 2021 Sky and Telescope, and uh, that actually led to a National Science Foundation grant at Goddard. And I guess I'm an advisor on that grant, but a lot of good things falling out of this program. Back to the net. Ah, excellent, Max. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions for Max about the uh, the grant program for and his uh, work as uh, as um, I should know the uh, solar system ambassador? Please come with your call. Coordinates everything for that net. 
Visit the most disaster-prone city in the universe every Friday. Search city and all are welcome. Of course, Saturdays is the night of net. So when you come visit, we have the uh, tech net at 7 o'clock, 7 to 8. Uh, anything having to do with amateur radio. From 9 until 10.30 is Sky Net, which is what you're on now. And then the 10.30 Net, which I'm going to tell you about here in a little bit, the Afterglow Movie Net. Daily at 6.30 to 7 o'clock is the ARRL National Training System, National Traffic System Training Net. Uh, that's where you get to move formalized tra traffic and be part of a formal net. This works whether you're on HF or on local frequency, so if you'd like to learn about that, maybe you're new to... Um, uh, amateur radio, this is a great net to get your feet wet and also uh, to, to uh, meet some new people if you're shy about getting on for the first time. Excellent net to do so. You can do no wrong. It's a training net. I also mentioned the Afterglow Movie Net. Here is my highly accurate information on tonight's Afterglow Movie Net. I'll write it down. There will be a test later. Andy and Opie stared at the radio in disbelief. Aunt B had brought a pie and packed it, parked it on Andy's desk. American apple pie. It had a file in it. Seems her former boyfriend was caught speeding inside town and didn't have the money to pay the speeding fine. It didn't matter. The radio was droning on about invasion taking place in New Jersey. The pie was getting cold. The sheriff Hick spoke. Aunt B cannot believe people in New Jersey are stupid enough to think there's some invasion by aliens. Even Barney wouldn't fall for this. Of course, after the invisible audience laughed, Barney blew through the door with his gun drawn. The aliens are attacking. The aliens are attacking. The unseen audience laughed again. Two things bothered Andy. One was how he was able to hear a live audio broadcast from 1939. And two, where did that invisible laughing come from? Join us for the next Afterglow Movie Masterpiece of Brave New Jersey from 2017 tonight at 10.30 p.m. And if you go to Afterglow Movie, that's two words on the um, uh, Facebook uh, platform, you'll be able to find the links and all the information on the movies if you want to get in there at the last minute. Okay, next up is uh, the Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas. So uh, let me see. I bet you Chaz has something on this because he left a note inside the notes. Uh, KF5JJ, Chaz, what do you have up for us on the TAS? Oh, you must be reading from the, uh, what is it now, 60-page long script now? Yeah, okay. Uh, Tom, there's actually a dog that's moving behind you. I thought it was a stuffed dog all this time, but it's actually moving behind you. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the next Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas Club meeting will be held on Friday, March the 25th, 2022, at 7.30 p.m. The meeting will be held on Zoom. Hopefully, we'll go back in person sometime in the next couple of months. Dr. Michael Pierce uh, from the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Wyoming will be our featured speaker. I'm not quite sure what his topic is. The task club members will receive an email link to the Zoom meeting in advance of the meeting, usually about a week ahead of time. And the Saturday night public observing sessions that TASS holds has been placed on hold because of COVID for about two years. One of the reasons why Skynet was picked to be on a Saturday night so that there would be an opportunity for live reports from task public observing sessions. But since they've been put on hold, we haven't heard any reports from the last two years. Check the Texas Astronomical Society website, texasastro.org, for up-to-date information and details about meetings and public observing sessions. And back to you, Tom, KF5JHA. Why, thank you, Chaz. And yes, the, uh, the video portion of this does have the dogs moving around, and uh, one of them uh, does sleep. This is past her usual bedtime, so she's usually laying there and sits and lies there motionless for about 90 minutes, the entire length of this net. So she does go into deep sleep, and I sometimes have to double-check on her, too. All right, 
Next up is the National Space Society events and activities that would be Bill in 5 bb Bill, I know you're checked in, so tell us about National Space Society, please. Very good, Ken. This is in 5 bb <clears throat> Yes, I am the membership uh, director of the North Texas chapter of the National Space Society. And we have our meetings on the um, we have the, our meetings on the uh, second Saturday, uh, Sunday afternoon of every month. I'm sorry, I was distracted there. And so our next meeting is tomorrow. It is uh, tomorrow, uh, March the 13th at 3:30 uh, p.m. And we're going back to in person. In fact, it's going to be a hybrid meeting. We're meeting in person at the Spring Creek Barbecue in Irving, the corner of Beltline and 183. And we'll also be trying to do it over WebEx, if I can make it work. I've done it before, but it's hard. So uh, if for some reason you'd like to uh, visit our meeting or you'd like to uh, either in person or remotely, send me an email. Uh, space at byram.net, S-P-A-C-E at B-Y-R-O-M dot N-E-T, or N-5-B-B at A-R-R-L dot net. Um, the topic tomorrow is going to be the future of NASA and commercial s space flight. Um, so we tried to do this at the last meeting, but we had some big technical trouble. So we're going to try again. Uh, it, it was all WebEx, and so it, there was nothing in person to... Anyway, we're going to try again tomorrow, and hopefully it'll work out just fine. Um, we participated at the Dallas Regional Science and Engineering Fair. I was one of the judges for National Space Society. Um, uh, award Gave some awards out, uh, although they won't be official for a while longer, so they're not public yet to some kids, some high school kids. And that was great fun. We got to do this over at Fair Park uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, the um, other, okay, beside the, um, the meeting uh, tomorrow, uh, we're going to be participating in the Design Your World STEM event. This is at the Girl Scout facility out um, in um, near the Boy Scout facility there uh, on Whispering Cedar Drive. Uh, this is uh, near uh, uh, I-20 and uh, Loop 12 and that whole area down there. Um, and so we're going to be doing that on Saturday, March the 19th with the Girl Scouts. And that's called the Design Your World STEM event. Um, and there are some other events which we're going to be participating in, which, um, whoops, I apologize. I wasn't completely prepared here, so I've got to look it up. Um, there's a few more things happening in the future, but they're actually not in my calendar yet, so I can't look them up. One more piece of news related to space uh, is, um, and this came through my, my group, National Space Society, Firehawk Aerospace, that's F-I-R-E-H-A-W-K, Firehawk, Firehawk Aerospace is a startup that is... Um, building 3D printed hybrid rocket engines and they just moved their headquarters to Richardson, Texas. So they're located off of Greenville uh, Avenue. This is right north of Campbell Road. So if you remember where the old Nortel headquarters was before they collapsed over on uh, 75, this is a couple of blocks to the east of that. A couple of blocks north of Campbell Road near the intersection of Glenville and, Cam and the Greenville Avenue. And um, 
Anyway, they're building hybrid rocket engines. What is a hybrid rocket engine, you might ask? Where they're doing it with a 3D printed version, so they take some rocket fuel, different from other rocket fuel that's been used in the past for this, and they're 3D printing it into the, the proper shape and everything. And the rocket uses liquid oxidizer. So it's a solid fuel rocket with liquid oxidizer, but they can start and stop the rocket, which is very unusual. So there's a lot of advantages to this. It's supposedly 20% of the price of uh, many other rockets, and they can design one in a few months rather than a few years. So uh, anyway, it's a startup, and they're in Richardson. So that sounds very interesting. Our National Space Society group is going to be trying to get some of those people to come to our meetings and talk to us about their, uh, their new technology. So we have two companies building rockets and rocket components in the DFW area, uh, two smaller companies. Uh, we have uh, the uh, Firehawk Aerospace, and we have Exos Aerospace uh, building uh, uh, rockets over uh, near Greenville off of I-30. That's all I got, Tom, in 5BB. Earth. 
the acid test is to make sure the signal is verified by multiple observatories at SETI Institute, senior astronomers, that's so stack. It would take a while to verify, and then the people who like to think about these matters says you would have to have a news conference and announce this to the world, he said, but he added that it would, wouldn't work unless everyone in the project were sworn to secrecy. In this era of news leaks, leaks, he said, the situation is very unlikely to hold. So scientists try instead to stick to a protocol that includes informing the public. The 2010 IAA protocol is only two per pages and covers facets such as searching for a signal, handling evidence, and what to do in case of a confirmed detection. If the evidence gets out to the public while the scientists are still analyzing the signal, Corrigan said, they could manage the public's expectations by using something called the Rio scale. It's essentially a numeric value that represents the degree of likelihood that an alien contact is real. Corrigan added that the Rio scale is under, is that interesting? Real. And it's called real, R-I-O scale. Coincidence? I don't think so. The Rio scale is also undergoing an update, and more should be coming about it, uh, later on. Of course, it's two years old, so it's probably already out. My data is already too old. Oh, well. Wow. That's a joke to those of you who know where this is going. If the aliens did arrive here, first contact protocols likely would be useless, because if they're smart enough to show up physically, they could probably do anything else, like, according to Showstack, personally, I would leave town Showstack equipped. I would get a rocket and get out of the way. I have no idea what they're here for. But there's little need to worry. An Independence Day scenario of aliens blowing up important national buildings, such as the White House, is extremely unlikely, Forgan said. Because interstellar travel is difficult to speak into something called the Drake Equation, which considers where the aliens would be and helps show why we haven't heard anything from them yet. To find a signal, first we have to be listening for it, SETI. Listening is going on all over the world, and in fact, this has been happening for many decades. The first modern SETI experiment took place in 1960 under Project Osmond. Cornell University astronomer Frank Drake pointed a radio telescope located at Green Bank, West Virginia, at two stars called Tau Ceti and Epsilon Arandi. He scanned at a frequency astronomers nicknamed the water hole, which is close to the frequency of light that's given off by hydrogen and hydroxyl, one of hydrogen's atoms bonded to one oxygen atom. crazy over this one, made international headlines after a project volunteer, volunteer Jerry Iman, wrote, wow, beside a strong signal, a telescope there received. The August 15, 1977, wow signal was never repeated, however. There have been many, many projects since then. As a taste, the SETI Institute was founded in 1984. While it may be the most famous of the SETI projects, there are many other independent SETIs at universities and institutions worldwide that have done work over the decades. One of the center's major initiatives is Project Phoenix, which scanned nearby sun-like stars. Currently, the SETI Institute, in collaboration with other institutes, is working on a concept called the Allen Telescope Array, which has dozens of radio dishes uh, in Northern California. In 2015, the well-known physicist Stephen Hawking and many other researchers launched Breakthrough Listen, a program that will scan 1 million Milky Way stars and 100 nearby galaxies for extraterrestrial life. While searches of alien messages aren't going ongoing in space, there have been efforts to communicate with beings that may come across our spacecraft. The Pioneer... if you're watching the video feed. The Pioneer 10 and 11 probes flew by Jupiter, and in Pioneer 11's case, Saturn to eventually make their way out of the solar system. Before their launches in 1972 and 73, respectively, a Pioneer plaque was mounted on board each spacecraft. It shows the form of a human body and where, where Earth is located in the galaxy.
Norman Voyager probes launched in 1977 to examine the outer solar system. Voyager 2 reached the inter interstellar space in 2012, while Voyager 1 is still at the edge of the solar system. I believe both of them have made it to interstellar space, although they still argue about that. Each of the spacecraft include two golden records with sounds recorded on Earth, ranging from whale calls to music to the word hello in many languages. The record also has diagrams of the human body and where our solar system is located. Scientists also transmitted a radio message from the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico in 1974. The so-called Arecibo message includes such things as numbers 1 through 10, the atomic numbers of elements such as hydrogen and oxygen, information about DNA, and diagrams of the human body, the Earth, and our solar system. In a related field, the study of exoplanets also accelerated at, in recent years with the Kepler mission, which has found more than 2,000 confirmed exoplanets alone, as well as other observatories on the ground and in space. Scientists are now trying to characterize which of these planets may be the most habitable. Atmospheric studies and more detailed looks at star activity will be uh, some of the activities scientists undertake with future telescopes, such as the James Webb Space Telescope, which was launched earlier this year. Sierra Z Bravo Max with a funny aside. Vice President of TAS, uh, I was coordinating Seth Shostak's visit to uh, speak to our group uh, back when we did things in person before the pandemic, and uh, I called him, and we were chatting, and I actually was at the TAS dark site up in the 16-inch dome having a great night, and as it turns out, Seth was in the control room at Hat Creek at the Allen Telescope Array. I said, hey, Seth, what are you looking at? He told me I dialed it in to the 16-inch, and we looked at the same thing. That's all. It was just a really funny story, and we had a great time with Seth Shostak. I had a dinner with everybody, the club officers and a few members, and he's a really nice guy. Back to the net. One, 
Uh, Romy, N-A-W-W-R, you said you were mobile someplace. Uh, stay away from the aliens. Let's just say that. If you see a bright light, keep driving on. Unless it's a flashing light, in which case I recommend you pull over. All right, next is Chaz, K-5-J-H-A, and he has what's up. So, Chaz, please go ahead with your report this evening. Why, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Tom. And it is the Ohio State University. Uh, and it was probably just me walking around on the ground plane of the radio telescope in 1977 because I was a student there at that time. That, that's what they detected. Uh, uh, I am an alien, yeah. Slide master, that's slide number one, isn't it? Uh, this is Chaz, KF5JHA. My degree is in astrophysics. I'm in charge of the astrophysics lab and geology lab at Dallas College on the Brookhaven campus. And we call this segment of Skynet was up. Slide number two is not quite right, so if you're looking at the video version, I forgot to change it from last year's version to this year's version. It should say March 13th, 2022. Anyway, uh, let's get into what the verbiage is for slide number two. So what do we do tonight that we only do once a year? No, we do Skynet every week. Uh, we change from standard time to daylight saving time. Yes, it is written and pronounced Daylight Saving Time, not Daylight Savings Time. Uh, tonight, in just a few hours, we change our clocks at 2 a.m. and go forward by one hour to 3 a.m. This makes us on Central Time Zone Daylight Time. Uh, so we say we spring forward. Uh, why do we do this crazy thing? Uh, we are actually on Daylight Saving Time longer than Standard Time, so Daylight Time is actually our standard time. Uh, couldn't we just stay on one or the other and not change? I have I confused you yet? Slide master, slide number three, please. When did this all start? Uh, well, I really don't want to leak my source, but according to Wiki, <laughs> that was supposed to be a funny joke, George Hudson uh, proposed this modern daylight time idea back in 1895. The German Empire actually implemented it on April the 30th, 1916. Most of the world does not observe daylight time because a large portion of the world population lived near and around the equator. And the topics were variation of the amount of light over a course of years, very small. Uh, but when uh, I lived in Seattle, which is located at 47 degrees north latitude, I remember late December going to work when it was dark. Yeah, it got daylight around 9 a.m. and I was already at work. And by 3 p.m. it was already getting dark, so I went home in the dark. Some people say I've been in the dark for a long time. But in contrast, at the end of June in Seattle, evening twilight didn't end until about 11 p.m. and the morning twilight began around 1 a.m. Not much time for nighttime astronomy during the summer. Slide master, slide number four. So why daylight time? The idea goes like this. Individuals in industrialized locations who follow a year-round schedule of commuting to work daily will awake an hour earlier than they would have otherwise. They will begin and complete their work duties an hour earlier, and they will have available to them an extra hour of daylight after their work day activities. However, they will have one less hour of daylight at the start of each day, making the policy less practical during the winter. But war does add a mix to this. During World War I, daylight time was used to try to conserve coal, and after World War I, daylight time was generally abandoned by most. Then came World War II, and daylight time came back and then went away again. Now, let's have an energy crisis. Sounds familiar. Back in the 1970s, oil prices went from $3 a barrel to $12 a barrel. Wow, four times as much back in the 1970s. And again, daylight time gets put back in place then, and now it has a foothold on all of us today. Now, wait, wasn't the price of a barrel of oil around $135 just a couple of days ago? Slide master, slide number five, please. 
when we shift to daylight time has generally changed over the years too. Right now in North America, we make the change from standard time to daylight time on the second Sunday of March at 2 a.m. We skip the hour from 2 a.m. to 3 a.m. on that day. To remember, we use the phrase, spring forward an hour, since we set our clocks forward an hour. In 2022, the change from daylight time happened, uh, uh, will happen tomorrow after uh, Skynet, uh, or after Skylo, uh, Sky, <laughs> Afterglow movie uh, tonight. You probably set your non-computer controlled clocks ahead by one hour uh, before you go to bed tonight. Now, on the first Sunday of November at 2 a.m., we go back to standard time and set our clocks back an hour to 1 a.m. But remember using the phrase, fall back an hour. This year, in 2022, that fall back date is on November the 6th. Slide master, slide number six, please. There are some locations in the U.S. that don't move their clocks around. Arizona, Hawaii, Alaska, and some. Maybe it could happen in Texas, too. Over the last couple of legislative sessions in Texas, there have been uh, Senate bills and House of Representative bills that propose that Texas either stays on daylight time year-round permanently or stay on standard time year-round permanently. If you like that idea, then contact your state representative and senator to save yes on these bills at the next legislative session. Slide master, slide number seven, please. Let's go on another topic. This year, the weekend of March the 4th to 5th, or March the 26th, 27th, will be a great time for a Messier Marathon. I talked about the Messier Marathon last week. If you missed my Messier Marathon coverage last week on Skynet, then go back and listen to the archive on YouTube. But if weather cooperates on March 26th, 27th, then I may do a pre-recorded session of my segment for Skynet. Hmm. Could be interesting. Slide master, slide number eight, please. The moon was at its first quarter phase on March the 10th, so the current phase of the moon is a waxing gibbous. The full moon will be on March the 18th. On March the 23rd, the moon is at perigee, which is the point in the moon's orbit that is closest to the Earth at a distance of 369,760 kilometers. On March the 25th, the moon will be at its third quarter phase. On March, uh, excuse me, on April the 1st, <laughs> no pulling, the moon will be at its, at its new phase. And on March, excuse me, April the 7th, I'm in March mode right now, what can I say? And on April the 7th, the moon will be at apogee, which is the point in the moon's orbit that is furthest from the Earth at a distance of 404,438 kilometers. Slide master, slide number nine, please. A conjunction of our two closest planets, Venus and Mars, will take place on March the 13th in the early morning southeastern sky. I'd be looking uh, eh, eh, somewhere around 6, 7. Oh, remember, by then, it's going to be getting daylight a lot later, an hour later than it did this morning. Slide master, slide number 10. Jupiter and Mercury will be in conjunction on the morning of March the 20th in the very low south, uh, excuse me, east-southeastern sky. If you can spot Jupiter and Mercury in strong twilight, then you should be able to spot three other planets to the upper right, Saturn, Venus, and Mars. This means you will have seen all five of the planets visible to the NAEI at the same time. What a wonderful opportunity. It doesn't happen very often. Slide master, slide number 11. On March the 20th at 11.53 a.m. Central Daylight Time is the moment of the vernal equinox. On this day, the sun rises directly east and sets directly west. There's only one other time of the year that the sun rises directly east and sets directly west. At least for us here, I should say. And that is the autumnal equinox. 
More on this next week during the What Is Up segment of Skynet. Slide Master, slide number 12, please. On March 24th, Venus, Mars, and Saturn make a very nice conjunction with each other uh, in the southeastern sky. Uh, that would be in the morning. But very low in the east southeastern sky, you'll be able to spot Jupiter and Mercury again. So once again, all five visible planets at once. What a bonus. And the planet Neptune can be spotted with a telescope in between Jupiter and and Mercury. That's worth a shot. Slide Master, slide number 13. On March 28th, in the early morning southeastern sky, you'll have a conjunction of the Moon, Saturn, Venus, and Mars. Once again, Jupiter and Neptune are still visible in the low east southeastern sky. Slide Master, slide number 14. And on March 30th, the conjunction of the Moon, Jupiter, and Neptune in the very low east-southeastern morning sky is something that you could look forward to. Slide number 15, and this is KFI, JJ, and this is Skynet. The next Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas club meeting will be held on Friday, March the 25th, 2022, 7.30 p.m. It will be on Zoom. Dr. Michael Pierce of the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Wyoming will be the featured speaker, and I'm not sure of what his topic. And of course, we don't have observing sessions on Saturday nights like we have because we've been put on hold because of COVID for the last two years. But if you want to check out the Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas website for details about their activities at texasastro.org. Slide master, slide number 16. Now, do any of you out there in Radio Land have a question or need a fill on any of the information, or do you just have a general question on astronomy? I don't know everything, but I might know the answer to your question, or another person on this net might know the answer. Come now with your call sign if you have a question. Okay. I was hoping that we'd have a question that maybe we could have Max answer since he's been at the U.S. Naval Observatory before. Okay, slide number 17. So as the moon waned at the end of February, so that these words for the segment of Skynet, stay safe, keep well, pray for our world. It's the only one where humans live. And until next week, actually I'll be doing another Skynet segment in a few minutes. Keep looking up so you know what's up. And this is Chaz, KF5JHA. Backdoor net control. Pray for Ukraine, too. Uh, let's see now. I think it's Grandpa Skynet, KE5ICX. That's our net control tonight. It's yours, Tom. Well, thank you, Jazz Jazz. You did great, great. And I'll explain that later, later. Or maybe I won't. But Chaz knows what I'm talking about, about. This is KE5 ICX in that control for tonight. Skynet! Next up is space exploration and space history, and Miss Kelly, K5 KTX, has it this evening. So uh, I think she's over on Echo Link, so I'm going to turn it over to her. I've got the slides ready to go. So, uh, Miss Kelly, it's an net is yours. Tom, this is K5KTX. Good evening to everyone on the net. Well, late breaking news as of yesterday, engineers and technicians at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida drove Crawler Transporter 2, which will carry NASA's moon rocket to the launch pad, to the doors of the Vehicle Assembly Building, or VAB. Soon, the 6.6 million pound crawler will go inside the VAB and slide under the Space Launch System rocket and Orion spacecraft placed on the mobile launcher. 
technicians uh, will finish up preparations to transport the rocket traveling at a top speed of one mile per hour to launch complex 39B for a wet dress rehearsal test ahead of the Artemis 1 launch. This week, the Kennedy team also completed painting the NASA worm logo on the Space Launch System solid rocket boosters. While painters added parts of the iconic logo before the segments were stacked, they had to wait until the boosters were fully assembled to finish the job. In addition, the team has continued to retract the 20 platforms that surround the Space Launch System rocket and Orion spacecraft ahead of rollout on March the 17th for the wet dress rehearsal test. The wet dress rehearsal will be the final major test for the Artemis 1 mission and will ensure the rocket, spacecraft, ground equipment, and launch team are go for launch. NASA is reviewing launch opportunities in April and May, so we have some exciting things to look forward to. Now, this coming week on NASA TV on Monday, March the 14th at 4.30 p.m. Central Daylight Time, there will be a news conference to discuss the first rollout and wet dress rehearsal for Artemis 1 readiness update. And then on March the 17th, Thursday at 4 p.m., we'll begin live coverage of that first rollout of NASA's Artemis 1 rocket. Now, in space and NASA history for this past week, starting with March the 6th, back in 2015, the Dawn spacecraft went into orbit around Ceres, a dwarf planet in the asteroid belt. Dawn utilizes a high-tech ion propulsion system, which has allowed it to go into orbit around two different celestial bodies, a first for any spacecraft. Dawn had previously studied Vesta between 2011 and 2012. March the 9th, back in 2011, Space Shuttle Discovery completed her final mission, STS-133, touching down NASA's Kennedy Space Center at 11.57 a.m. Eastern Time. Discovery first launched in 1984, the third shuttle orbiter introduced into the NASA fleet. She flew a total of 39 missions, more than any other shuttle, made more than 5,800 orbits around the Earth, and has carried 252 crew members into space. Among those crew members were a number of trailblazers, including Eileen Collins, who became the first female shuttle pilot and commander on Discovery. Bernard Harris became the first African-American to perform a spacewalk. Senator Jake Garn became the first sitting member of Congress in space, and Senator John Glenn became the oldest person to fly in space. Discovery was the first shuttle to dock with the International Space Station on STS-86 after the delivery of the Unity module by Endeavour, on STS-88. On her final mission, the crew of STS-133, Steve Lindsay, Eric Bowe, Alvin Drew, Nicole Stott, Steve Bowen, and Mike Barrett attached the permanent multi-purpose module to the International Space Station. After retirement, Discovery was delivered to the Smithsonian Institution and is now on display at the National Air and Space Museum. And let's see, March the 10th, back in 2006, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, or MRO, entered orbit around Mars. The spacecraft fired its six main engines for about 25 minutes. This put MRO in a long elliptical orbit. Over the next six months, MRO used close passes through the upper atmosphere of Mars, known as aero braking, to slow itself by about 1,000 meters per second and arrive in a near-circular science orbit. Built by Lockheed Martin under the supervision of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, MRO was designed to analyze soil and surface features to determine the history of planetary water sources, both on and under the surface. The spacecraft was also outfitted with one of the largest cameras flown on a planetary mission up to that point in order to observe geological and water features that could obstruct or damage landing and roving vehicles. Well past the planned two-year primary science mission, MRO starts its 17th year in orbit around Mars, continuing to analyze the signs of water on Mars and providing telecommunications relay for our other spacecraft on and around Mars.
March 11, way back in 1960, Pioneer 5 was launched from Cape Canaveral Air Force Station to begin research on the space between Earth and Venus. The spacecraft carried six scientific instruments used to measure magnetic field phenomena, solar flare particles, and ionization in the interplanetary region. Pioneer 5 sent over 3 billion bits of data back to Earth at a maximum speed of 64 bits per second. Regular data transmissions lasted only until the end of April 1960. The last communication of any sort with Pioneer 5 came at the then record distance of 22.5 million miles on June 26, 1960. Data from Pioneer 5 confirmed the existence of magnetic fields throughout our solar system. KTX for Skynet. On March the 12th, back in 2015, NASA's four identical magnetospheric multi-scale or MMS spacecraft launched from Cape Canaveral. The MMS mission is the first space mission dedicated to studying a phenomenon called magnetic, magnetic reconnection, a process thought to be the catalyst for some of the most powerful energy explosions in our solar system. The process occurs when magnetic fields connect, disconnect, and reconfigure explosively, which releases bursts of energy. The MMS mission's goal is to provide the first three-dimensional views of the reconnection happening in Earth's magnetosphere. As of March 2020, the MMS spacecraft had enough fuel to remain in operational until 2040. Tonight, astronaut birthdays for the past week. Uh, March the 6th, back in 1927, was Gordon Cooper, who was part of the Mercury Atlas 9 and the Gemini 5 mission, and I'm very happy to say that I had the opportunity to meet him um, just a few years before he passed away. So what a, what a uh, great person to meet. March the 7th, 1936, Lauren Acton, who was on space shuttle mission STS-51F. And March the 10th, 1961, Laurel Clark, uh, who was on Space Shuttle Mission STS-107. As you know, uh, she was one of the seven astronauts we lost on that mission. March the 11th, 1956, Curtis Brown, whew, um, he was on several Space Shuttle missions, STS-47, 66, 77, 85, 95, and 103. And March the 12th, 1923, Wally Shiroff, who was on Mercury Atlas 8, Gemini 6A, and Apollo 7. And that's all I've got this evening. Tom, this is K5 KTX. Back to you. Very good. Thank you, Ms. Kelly. Appreciate the report. And this is K5 ICX. My name is Tom. We're doing Skynet. Well, we can't let Jazz get too far away, so I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to him. He has another segment to do. This one is Miss Carolyn's Constellation of the Week. So, Jazz, please take it away. But bring it back when you're done. But, Mr. Net Control, you didn't repeat everything. But, Mr. Net Control, you didn't repeat everything. Maybe it has to do with the Constellation of the Week. We'll get to that in a moment. Miss Carolyn's Constellation of the Week is named in honor of Silent Key, Carolyn, KC5OZT. Carolyn contributed to Skynet each week, almost from its beginning in 2012 until May of 2019, with a detailed look at one particular constellation each week. Thus, there are about 52 easily visible constellations seen in Texas throughout the year out of the 88 total constellations. So, Miss Carolyn covered the entire sky as seen over North Texas in a year. In her honor, we have continued that tradition of a constellation per week and named this segment after her. Miss Carolyn's constellation this week is Gemini the Twins. I guess it's a two for one. I guess it's a two for one. Quoting from the Task Spectrum article, Gemini is Latin for twins. Two stars, Castor and Pollux, are the brightest stars in the constellation and named after the twin brothers who were prominent in Greek and Roman mythology. Pollux was immortal and Castor was mortal. Well, uh, upon Castor's death, Pollux asked Zeus to let him 
share his immortality with his brothers so that they could stay together. As such, they are together forever in the skies at night. Slide master, slide number 19. This is why you stay up late at night, because of the jokes of the week, I know. So what did the drummer call his twin daughters? And a one, and a two. I thought that was funny. I failed my calculus exam because I was seated in between identical twins. It was very difficult for me to differentiate between them. Oh, Billy, I hope you enjoyed that one. My twin brother refers, uh, prefers to take the stairs, but I like the elevator. I guess we were raised differently. Did you hear the one about the twin boys born in Mexico? When you've seen Juan, you've seen Jamal. What do you call a pair of identical cats? Duplicates. Okay, that one's maybe a stretch. I have one more left. Yeah, I see applause over there on Echo Link. Yeah. A friend of mine told me that my daughter and my wife look like twins. I said to them, well, they were separated at birth. Uh, slide Master, we better go on to slide number 20 now. Master is a multiple star system that lies about 47 light years away. Visually, in a telescope, it appears as two white stars, just 2.2 arc seconds apart. There is Castor A and Castor B, and there is a third, much fainter member, Castor C, separated by about 72 arc seconds. Each of these three stars is a spectroscopic binary, so Castor is a six-star system. The two components of Castor A are each about twice the size of the sun. Castor B components are about 1.5 times the size of the sun. Castor C's components are red dwarfs and are smaller than the sun. In addition to being spectroscopic, uh, Castor C is an eclipsing binary as well. Castor is noted for being the first true physical binary star to be recognized as a binary star. Pollux is actually slightly brighter than Castor, yet it has been giving the beta designation. Burnham's Celestial Handbook notes that some theorize that one of the two bright stars of Gemini may have changed its brightness over the last few centuries. Pollux's yellow star is about four to five times larger than our sun. It is about 35 light years away. Pollux is one of the few naked eye stars ever to have been found to have an exoplanet orbiting around it. It's believed to have a mass of about 2.3 times that of Jupiter. Delta Genorum, named Wasat, uh, means middle, and this star is close to the middle of Gemini. The name also refers to the star's proximity to the ecliptic. This double is easily split. Uh, much easier than Castor, with uh, two stars separated by 6.8 arc seconds compared to Castor's 2.2 seconds. Uh, the brighter star, shining at about 3.5 uh, magnitude, is whitish in color, owing to the fact that it is an F white star. There's classifications of O through M, and this is an F type star. The dimmer companion shines at 8.2 magnitude and is a K type of star, a yellow orange star. Interestingly, it appears to have a purple tint, according to Dave Hutchinson. Historical note the late Clyde Tomball discovered Pluto only a half a degree away from Delta Genorum in February of 1930. Slide Master, slide number 21, please. M35 is the only, only Messier object in Gemini. M35 is an open cluster. It is bright enough to be detected with the naked eye in a very dark sky site. Low powers are the best for observing it because it covers about a half a degree of the sky. A six to eight inch telescope 
or larger is needed to appreciate it fully. It can be enjoyed with smaller uh, telescopes and binoculars, too. When observing M35, note that the number of stars in the cluster have different colors. Many have noted what looks like a stream or curving lines of stars in M35. This effect has called a number of observers to observe M35 as a bursting sky rocket. In the Deep Sky Wonders column, the late Walter Scott Houston wrote that M35 was his favorite open cluster. Slide master, slide number 22, please. NGC stands for New General Catalog, 2158 is an open cluster only 22 arc minutes away from M35. With sufficient aperture, both clusters can be seen in low power field of view. Though for many, NGC 2158 was relatively unknown, lost in the glory of the brighter and larger neighbor. While M35 has about 2,800 light years away, NGC 2158 is much further at about 16,000 light years away. NGC 2158 is much denser than M35, but its great distance renders it relatively dim in appearance, and it suffers in light polluted skies tremendously. In Burnham's Celestial Handbook, Robert Burnham Jr. writes that it may be a transition case between galactic open cluster and the globulars. Indeed, studies of NGC 2158's HR diagram and stellar population have supported this idea. Slide master, slide number 23. NGC 2392, the Eskimo Nebula, is a planetary nebula. Visual challenge object. Uh, it is uh, in his book, The Caldwell Objects. Stephen J. Amira writes that the Eskimo Nebula appears so nearly stellar at low power that it would not be difficult to sweep past it while looking for a diffuse object, which adds to the challenge of finding this object. However, even in a small telescope, NGC 2392 is a bright enough at magnitude 9.2 that many observers note that it is easily seen or it appears bright, which may be why it's included in the Astronomical League Urban Club list. Dave Hutchinson recommends an 8-inch scope or larger, and it is a marvelous object to be viewed in a 16-inch uh, using high magnification and an O3 filter. With equipment like that, you may be able to make out some structure that is noted in some photographs. The shape and structure of NGC 2392 suggests that a mini human face surrounded by a fur-lined parka, which gives it a popular name of the Eskimo Nebula. With a bright central star highlighting the nose and the face, some have seen a face of a clown instead, while others see a face of a lion with a furry mane. Robert Brennan Jr. wrote to him, the whole nebula irresistibly suggests the classic, unforgettable features of the late W.C. Fields. Slide master, slide number 24. There are a few more Astronomical League observing program objects in the constellation of Gemini of the Twins. I'm giving you a sampling of a, some of those objects. The Astronomical League, excuse me, the Astronomical League has over 73 different observing programs, which most have about 100 objects. If you observe just 10 different objects in an observing club each month, then you can earn a certificate and a pen in about a year. And slide master, slide number 25. And that is Miss Constellations of the, uh, Miss Carolyn's Constellation of the Week, Gemini of the Twins. I want to thank my friends Dave Hutchinson and Dennis Harwell for the research and words on the deep sky objects that I've used tomorrow and steal for every night, including tonight. I also at times use the website constellation-guide.com for information. Now next time, I'll take a look at Boopus, the Boop Deck. We'll talk about that more next week. And this is KF5 JHA. Back to our net control, 73, everyone. Take it away, Tom.
looking at the script, and I thought it said puppies, the poop deck. I, I got one of those here. But it's actually puppets, the poop deck. All right, this is KE5ICX. My name's Tom. I want to acknowledge a couple of people that are over on YouTube. We got KE5ZTV, that's Kyle. I think he was in Dallas. He may even be in Dallas today. We got KD5IFS, that's Brian. He appears to have been in Dallas. Uh, I recognize the scenery behind him, so I would say that's him. Okay, uh, let's see here. 1019, we have time. We go ahead and do space launches for this week. We have coming up. Uh, and how all this information is available on spaceflightnow.com uh, forward slash launch schedule. We have on March 13th the Rocket 3.3 S4 crossover. This is the LP3 D Pacific Space uh, Port Complex in Kodiak Island, Alaska. I saw one of the launches there. I think it went sideways. Was the last one I saw. Commercial small satellite launch deployed by Astro will launch non deployable. Demonstration payload for near space launch. Commercial payload is named S4 Crossover and will remain attached to the Astro rocket second stage after ending orbit. Testing communications instruments and gathering data on the space environment. We have in March, but to be determined, March com Launch Complex 1A in the Haya Pen uh, Peninsula in New Zealand. Our rocket lab electron rocket will launch two small second generation Black Sky commercial fleet. Satellites for Earth observation. Rocket Lab will ha has nicknamed this one without mission of heat. Yeah, you heard me right. March 18th, uh, this may fly. So use ISS 67S from Falcon or Cosmodrome, Cosmodrome. Russian government Soyuz rocket launched the crewed Soyuz MS 21 spacecraft to the International Space Station with the next team of three cosmonauts to live and work on the complex. Crew is led by Commander Oleg Atomov with flight engineers Denis Matveyev and Sergei Korsakov. The rocket will fly in the Soyuz 2.1A configuration. March 18th, 19th, the Falcon 19 launch with the Starlink at uh, SLC 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. The Falcon 9 rocket will launch another batch of Starlink Internet satellites. Falcon 9's first stage book. Booster will land on a drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean. On March 30th, Falcon 9 Axiom Mission 1 will launch a Crew Dragon spaceship on its sixth flight with astronauts. The commercial mission managed by Axiom Space will be commanded by former NASA astronaut Michael Lopez Alegria. Paying passengers include Larry Connor, Mike Pate, Eaton Stribby, and also on board for the 10-day mission is on the International Space Station. Crew Dragon will return to a splashdown at sea uh, sometime here in uh, the future. doesn't say when. And I'm going to go ahead and give this last one for now. April, Falcon 9 Transporter 4 will launch uh, to be determined from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. With its mission is a ride share flight to a sun synchronous orbit with numerous small micro satellites and nano satellites to commercial and government customers. All right, that's it. I'm going to give now. Uh, I'm going to move quickly over to uh, recent astronomical discoveries. That would be Ms. Brenda at WB50ZL from KE5ICX. What do you have for us? Thank you, Tom. This is WB50ZL. This article is entitled, Powerful Warm Wind Seen Blowing from a Neutron Star as it Rips Up Its Companion. Using the most powerful telescopes on Earth and in its space, a team of astronomers has found for the first time blasts of hot, warm, and cold winds from a neutron star whilst it consumes matter from a nearby star. The discovery provides new insight into the behaviors of some of the most extreme objects in the universe. Low-mass X-ray binaries, LMXBs, are systems containing a neutron star or black hole. They are fueled by material ripped from a neighboring star, a process known as accretion. Most accretion occurs during violent eruptions, where the systems brighten dramatically. At the same time, some of the material that spirals in is propelled back into space in the form of disk winds and jets. The most common 
signs of outflowing material from astronomical objects are associated with warm gas. Despite this, only winds of hot or cold gas uh, have been observed in transient X-ray binaries until now. In this new study, the team of researchers from 11 countries, led by, by the University of Southampton, studied the recent eruption of the X-ray binary known as Swift J1858. They used a companion, I'm sorry, a combination of telescopes, including NASA's Hubble Space Telescope (HST), the European Space Agency's H, um, XMM Newton Satellite, the European Southern Observatory Organization's Very Large Telescope (VLT), and Spanish Gran Telescopio Canaria (GTC). The results. warm wind and ultraviolet white wavelengths occurring at the same time as signatures of a cold wind at optical wavelengths. This is the first time that winds from such a system have been seen across different bands of the electromagnetic spectrum. Lead author Dr. Noel, Cas Noel Castro Segura of the University of South Southampton says eruptions like this are rare and each of them is unique. Normally, they are heavily obscured by interstellar dust, which makes observing them really difficult. Swift J1858 was special because even though it is located on the other side of our galaxy, the obscuration was small enough to allow for a full multi-wavelength study. Only one other system, the black hole X-ray binary, V4046, has shown similar properties. However, our attempt to perform the same experiment on that system was unsuccessful because the eruption ended before we could get the ground-based and space-based telescopes to observe it simultaneously. Co-author Dr. Hernandez Santisteban from University of San Andrews said, Swift J1858 is a newly discovered X-ray transient event that displays extreme variability across the electromagnetic spectrum, which presented a rare opportunity. All the astronomers in the field are incredibly excited to the point that we combined our efforts to cover the full spectrum from radio to X-ray using state-of-the-art observatories on Earth and in space, said Dr. Uh, Dr. Castro Segura continued. Co-author Natalie Dinganar from the University of Amsterdam added, neutron stars have an immensely strong gravitational pull that allows them to gobble, gobble up gas from other stars. Stellar cannibals are, however, messy eaters. How much of that gas that neutron stars pull towards them is not consumed, but flung into space at high speed. This behavior has a large impact both on the neutron star itself and on its immediate surroundings. In this paper, we report on a new discovery that provides key information about the messy eating patterns of these cosmic cookie monsters. Well, there's a little more of this article, actually quite a bit more, but we're almost out of time, so I'm going to cut it off there. This can be found at uh, ScienceDaily.com. So, back to net, WB5OZL. JHA recheck.
being run together by Russia and the United States, and there could be some challenges over the next week or two. So you just might want to keep ear to the news to find out what's going to happen. This is KFI of JHA. Back to our net control. I'm completely operational, and all my circuits are functioning perfectly. After the low movie net. Which is kind of humorous in and of itself, if there weren't such tragic background behind it. But, yeah, uh, there is a YouTube somebody put together what the International Space Station might look like if the Russian modules were to be removed. Uh, they can conveniently, or maybe not so conveniently, be detached from the rest of the ISS. Very interesting. participating on the air. Thanks to all who did so this evening. Hope you'll join us here next week and every Saturday night at 9 p.m. to discuss astronomy, space, and space exploration. On this map, the sky is never the one limit. Of course, always looking for new net controls for this and all the DARC nets. If you'd like to try your hand at it, uh, just contact any of the net controls or send an email to nets at w5fc.org. You can follow topics and discussion about this net and astronomy in general on Facebook and Twitter, as well as our audio and video feeds and streams. We archives and other useful internet resources by going to w5fc.org at the conclusion of this net. So next Saturday night, this is Kilo Echo 5, India, Charlie X-Ray, closing the net at 22.31 local time. 73, everybody, and enjoy discovering the universe. And we will be back for the Afterglow Movie Net uh, Brave New Jersey. Yep, that's the name of the thing. Uh, we'll be back, be back in about five minutes. So go refresh your drinks, powder your noses, and all that other stuff. See you in five. This is GE5. ICX clear for now.
here talking about maybe science fiction movies or something that came close to that, and we decided to make a net out of it. So we organized and figured out a way of seeing the movie every week. This week's movie is called Brave New Jersey. Brave New Jersey, and it's about the 1938 uh, Orson Welles radio broadcast in the sense that it's this mythical town that they say everything's true, but it's not. Uh, where uh, the town goes kind of crazy when they think that they are be- their neighboring town, Grover's Mill, is being destroyed by alien invaders from Mars. So that's where it starts, and then we have the story of the madcap things that happen in Lullaby, New Jersey. Now, I checked the wiki to find out if there was anything really much to talk about the plot. There wasn't, so I quickly found a... Um, review of it. This came from GoneWithTheTwins.com. Uh, it's uh, is part review and part description. So I'm going to read the description part. So please stand by. It's October 30th, 1938 in the serene town of Lullaby, New Jersey and downtrodden mayor Clark Hill, played by Tony Hale, Saunders about preparing for the unveiling of the Rotolactor, a grandiose cow milking apparatus, when a radio announcement warns of an imminent attack on New Jersey by hostile Martians. Bill sees his sleepy city descend into hysteria and chaos. Gary Kingpin, Paul Davidson, played by Sam J.R., drives off in a panic, leaving behind his wife, Lorraine, and daughter, Anne. Uh, that draggled Reverend Ray loses what's left of his faith and abandons his congregation. And prim and proper school teacher Peg Prickett sheds her inhibitions to forsake demure fiance Charlie for bad boy Sparky. As lullaby citizens pro- profess pent up desires and face the harsh realities of their own mortality, the t- town's militarized cuckoo, Captain Ambrose T. Collins, played by Raymond J. Berry, attempts to band them together into a makeshift regiment to battle the approaching aggressors. Everything you see is true. With this line of narration, it's virtually certain that embellishments and caricatures will ensue. Uh, let's see here. Brave New Jersey handles the comic elements of this historical event quite soundly. That are surrounded an ensemble of quick, quirky, vastly different personas, yet somehow many of them feel terribly ordinary. This is the review part. Let's see. Uh, we'll come back to it later. Uh, this reviewer from I'm Gone with the Twins gave it 6 out of 10, which I thought was kind of uh, generous, but what do I know? Okay, so what we'll do is I'm going to go ahead and take a check-in. All you have to do is give me your call sign, your name, and did you see Brave New Jersey? If you did not, that's okay. We can discuss the topic at the end, which is the invasion from Martians uh, from the 1938 CBS Mercury, of the theater, Mercury Theater of the Air of the Worst and Most War of the World. So uh, that's fine, too. So we'll start. Please come with your call sign, your name, and did you see Brave New Jersey? Please come out. Uh, this is November Tango 5, Tango Mike. I did not have a chance to see the movie. I will probably not say much. WB5OZL, Brenda DeSoto, I did see the movie. Kilo Golf 5, Bravo Zoo, Whiskey Jay, and they're with her, uh, I did see the film. Kilo Bravo 9, Sarah Oscar Kilo, Sean of Fort Worth, I did see the movie. Okay, we've got NT5TM Tony. He 
did see the movie, WB50OZL, Miss Brenda, yep, she saw the movie, KG5BZWJ, yes, she saw the movie, KB9SOK, Sean, he did see the movie, do I have additional check-ins, folks who would like to check in for the Ashquo movie, Brave New Jersey, from 20. TM correction. Let me guess, Tony, you're co you're you're correcting and saying yes, you did see the movie, but but go ahead. Uh, no, I meant to say I did not see the movie. Either I said it wrong or you read it back wrong earlier. NT5 TM, I did not see the masterpiece.
Okie doke. Thank you, Sean. And yes, smarter people. I don't know if, I don't think, you know, Albert Einstein could have pulled this one out of the deep dive, but you never know. Maybe somebody has something, you know, very introspective and understanding. Tony would normally do this, but he decided he watched five minutes of the movie and then said, to hell with this. I'm going to go and find a sharp object and stick it in my forehead. He told me that one time. Uh, next is Jay, KB5BZW, KG5BZW. Jay, your thoughts on the plot for t this week's movie? Um, hell is this thing? Brave New Jersey. Uh, go ahead, Jay.
lot of self-examination and people figuring out what they are and what they want and so forth. And most movies have something like that. Might have been more interesting if it was just Brave Jersey. I don't know. It would be a, a different take on it. The... Um, That, that was an odd time, or it was an, an interesting time, the late 30s, just after the Depression, and uh, people, uh, you know, were just coming off of it. They, these people were fairly well-to-do for the era, especially a rural area. They all had nice homes and radios and cars, and uh, there seemed to be a fair amount of affluence in the area, but I, you know, I don't know. So, I'm still trying to figure out how I feel about it. Yeah, it was cute. Would I recommend it? I don't know. It just didn't have a lot of meat on the bone. It didn't have a lot of substance. It was just kind of a cute little, little story. Somebody said it's like a Hallmark movie. That's true. Just sort of a lightweight movie for a popcorn movie. Okay, back to Nat, wb 5 Hi, thank you, Brenda. And uh, you gave me something to say about the movie now. Um, an asterisk, no notes, but I'll remember it. Tony, t 5 tm uh, what are your thoughts? Do you, would you want to watch this movie? Did you listen to the War of the Worlds, the Mercury Theater on the Air? Uh, have, have you ever watched the radio program before? Just simple questions I'll ask you and then you can respond, which is now. Well, actually, I, I did a bit of horror earlier tonight. I'm, I'm going to bl blame Chaz, although it might have been your fault. Uh, during Skynet, it sounded like there was a chance to see Neptune later this month, and I, I did double-check some details on that, and yes, there is. It will be close to both Venus and Jupiter, well, in April, uh, so we've got a ways to go, but unfortunately, just before sunrise, and, and getting up just before sunrise is, is like being in a horror movie for me. I, I, oh, boy. That's really scary. I might explode or my head might melt. So, so Skynet was a little scary, uh, but fortunately I didn't see this movie, so I did not have a chance to be scared by the impending Martian invasion. Uh, that, that was a relief. And, and no, what people have said has not inspired me to see this movie. It, it sounds like the plot was weak, and I haven't heard anyone talking about their favorite character yet. You know, and the characters are great. People can't hold themselves back, and that, that hasn't happened. So, so I'm not confident in, in that part of the net either. Uh, <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I think I will, I will give this one a pass. I still haven't seen Escape from the Planet of the Apes, and I still want to do that based on all the interesting things people said about it. Maybe I should find some time tomorrow to do that. NT5 TM. Well, thank you, Tony. And, and uh, that, that was a nice lifeline you sent out, uh, throwing it out. You failed to watch this week's movie, but you talked about a previous movie that people had given a fairly positive review just to keep the gangs from coming to your home and throwing things at your house. That's fine. It works, maybe. I don't know. We'll have to ask around. What would Orson Welles do to make this story about your, a radio story about your, your transgression of not seeing the movie that was assigned you a week ago? Oh, well, it doesn't matter. All right, before I make my comments, I'll see if anybody else is out there. Anybody would like to join us? Tonight's movie is Brave New Jersey. Brave New Jersey. Uh, from 2017, so you don't necessarily have to have seen it, but if you did, either way, check in. Please come to your call sign name, did you see this movie? Kilo India 5, Kilo Whiskey Golf, cruise in Arlington, and I did see the movie.
the movie, so we'll go ahead and ask. Uh, we're on the round where we're talking about the plot. What did you think of the plot from KE5IC? Yeah, I went ahead and set up my other radio. Uh, HT wasn't pulling it. Uh, I actually enjoyed this film. I'd never heard of it, not seen it until uh, last week. And uh, I really did enjoy it. I thought it was very well acted. The characters were all likable. Um, surprised it didn't do better and hadn't, hadn't kind of made a name for itself. Yeah, it was a light film. Um, Plot-wise, well, you were looking for the characters to, to develop, and I think that's what we saw, particularly with the mayor. Uh, we had the love story um, that ended up sort of working itself out. Um, I guess there was the coming-of-age part with the teens that was a little bit weak, uh, but um, um, I, I kind of liked it. The, uh, I'll give you one of the things that had me laugh out loud was uh, the, uh, the tired... Uh, a worn out uh, uh, priest uh, uh, when he came walking in the first time and looked up suggested to him no one said or sang a thing and he looked up and he said any requests I really kind of like that so they were enduring endearing pardon me endearing um, characters so I thought it was okay I thought it was uh, it was kind of uh, special um, the last part I have a thought on is I did think the writers might have had intended a tragedy at some point and been uh, talked out of it because um, it stayed comedy the entire time but that's uh, that's my comments on the plot and basically on the movie itself so I'll turn that back over to you Ned thanks And uh, those are all good comments because I didn't have anything nearly approaching that as far as uh, positive for the film. And uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Let's see. Um, my opinion, that probably, probably, part of what happened to me was I like, kind of fell asleep towards the end of the movie. So uh, some of the, 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 one of the things they always say is the characters are always supposed to have changed from the beginning of the film until the end of the film. And they did, but I kind of fell asleep during the middle part of the film, so I didn't know the motivation outside of the aliens themselves uh, attacking, so so we thought. Um, my comments, though, probably are more pedestrian in the sense that, is this town the only place? I mean, are they the only ones that actually tuned in to Mercury Theater on the Air? From what I understand, Mercury Theater on the Air on CBS was not incredibly listened to. Now, of course, you only have, what, the two or three radio stations, uh, national radio going on at the time, and it was during prime time. So, yeah, yeah, it sounded great and all that. But, and I suppose there, been, there were a lot of people listening, but I, I don't know. It, from what I've read and what I've heard is that there hasn't been that many, uh, there weren't as, as much craziness as one would expect on that day. That's okay. That's fine. Um, the fact that nobody changed the radio station and this is the whatever. I know other movies have discussed this and said, well, how come just the one? And nobody else has gotten word yet that the entire planet was being decimated. Seems a little far-fetched, but that's okay too. It's supposed to be a comedy, and I'm okay with the comedy part if it's funny. I didn't feel it as funny as maybe it could have been. There's always a, a possibility of dark humor, of course, which is, uh, uh, you know, how, how does each character uh, handle the thing? And funny humor, I, I thought that, and I know this would get into characterization, but uh, the crazy guy outside of town that decided to relive war, oh, it was fantastic. He was, it was amazingly funny and, and somewhat scary as some of the residents decided so that kind of, kind of, uh, and, and rallied the troops, so to speak. That seemed possible, I suppose, and that people in a, in a large situation with lots of people uh, act that way, and it, it, you would find it's a kind of a free-for-all. So, yeah, that kind of made sense, the part play. And, and Reverend Rogers, 
kid would be in spot. So that that was a little I thought a little over the top uh, on the plot. I, I know they were going for comedy, but uh, yeah, I mean, really, that was you know kind of. Uh, I'm curious to see what others have to say about the characters. Like I said, they they were somewhat cute, I guess. Uh, and but uh, I kind of agree with Tom. I kind of wanted to doze off during this because it was just a little little on the slow side moving. And uh, but by far, it's not the worst thing we've seen. Back to net. This is KB9. It's okay. because otherwise this net would be about three and a half minutes long. Next we have Jay, KG5VZW, mixing letters around. Jay, what did you think of characterization of KE5ICX? Hey guys, this is KG5VZW. Uh, on Echo Link, just because uh, this is a little bit more convenient at the moment. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I, I, uh, on, uh, triggered a, uh, a, a memory of me, and it, 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 it felt like, uh, they were trying to recreate the, uh, experience that you might have in watching the, uh, 90s sitcom Northern Exposure, except uh, the characters in that uh, little uh, TV show were a lot more interesting. Um, I just thought everybody was boring, even the president of, or whatever, I don't know what the, 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 the owner, the inventor, the, uh, the whatever, that guy, the, 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 uh, the uh, rotor, roto milk, uh, Whatever it was, um, I mean, he is obviously supposed to be uh, a. Um, oh, I'm not sure to be quite because uh, there's not really any antagonist in this film. I mean, you can kind of call him an antagonist, but he's um, kind of just more of a counterpoint. Um, which might be part of the problem with the film is it's like, it's, it's, uh, there's hardly anybody you're, you're, you're supposed to, uh, dislike or like that you're disliking, if that makes any sense. Um, yeah, I, 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 I just don't, uh, gotta be a little bit more interesting people in, in this, and they just did not make these, uh, this character is interesting. Uh, it's that uh, none of the actors fall. Uh, I, it's, it's just the way it was written. I, I and probably directed. I, I, I think. I, I think the actors are probably capable enough. The, uh, I don't know. The, the teacher actually. I, I wanted to root for. Okay, there's two characters I like. The captain, of course, the, the, which seems to be the whole driving uh, character in the film, really. But he, 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 um, it's good enough for what I, well, <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't know if it's really good enough or, or what, but it, it, was, it was like a, of, of the characters, it's probably the most interesting, the, the, the blonde um, school teacher with, uh, you know, the, the she, was, she became the fiance. And um, I was kind of uh, looking for something interesting to happen with her, and I guess some kind of interesting things happened, but they were so predictable. Or if, if, if predictable is not the right term, I, I don't know. It just... So... Uh, there's just so many times I, I had to just stop the film and do something else because I just get bored with everything. And um, for a film like this, which seems to be uh, uh, more or less a, a character-driven, that's a big uh, sign that uh, the characters just need a little bit more something. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you. Okie dokie. Thank you, Jay. Next up is Brenda, WB5 
OZL. Uh, tell us what you think about Brave New Jersey and the acting, or the actors, your choice, or both, from KE5ICX. KE5OZL, Brave New Jersey, Brave New Jersey, Brave New Jersey, I thought the acting was just barely adequate. Um, probably the minister struck me as maybe the best. Um, but and there, there weren't any bad actors in it. They just, there weren't any standouts. None of these people we'd ever heard of before. I certainly hadn't. Uh, so far as how they were cast, no quarrel with that. But um, the the characters themselves, not the actors, the characters were kind of two-dimensional and cardboard, I think, and not terribly interesting people. The mayor came the closest, but he was just kind of a loser. His singing was awful, and he invented this thing that didn't work. Don't know what he actually did for a living. He was the mayor, and of course, that doesn't pay. How did he get elected? Usually mayors are a little more... more sociable and engaging than he was. He was just sort of a dork. But, uh, you know, you, you start off with the stereotype uh, jerk of a husband, orders his wife around, does not appreciate her, and she's a stereotype uh, abused wife who doesn't speak up to him or, you know, she takes it. You know, that's irritating, but it, it just happens all the time, but it's a stereotype. So that was a little bit annoying. The kids, the kids were okay. I have no, no problem with that. There was some effort to show growth and enlightenment with these characters, and there was some of that. that some of that was kind of satisfying. All right, back to net, WB5 OZL.
as I said before, I thought, you know, what we were seeing is the characters coming into their own and, and um, they all seemed kind of to be floating through life, but then uh, kind of sharpening up, making decisions, and, and as I said, coming into their own. So there, I liked that development. I thought some of the, the, the Lorraine character, for example, seemed very familiar to me. I may have confused her with somebody else, but I thought she did such a good job on acting, as did most of them. That made me want to invest in them, and, and uh, as I said before, they were likable, except for the psycho school teacher. Um, I think part of it, um, the negative comments that we're hearing might have to do with the we had a character named Sparky, but we had no radio, and I know that was a letdown for all of us. Okay, that was kind of uh, kind of a reach there. Um, I've, one comment I'll, I'll make besides just the blanket statement I've already made about the characterization is being likable, and um, I thought well acted because they made me like them. Um, is that my mother uh, was six years old when this radio broadcast came out, and I'm sure she did not hear it. Um, but the first time I saw the film War of the Worlds, she told me about what I think we've all pretty much been told is an urban legend, that there really was panic throughout New Jersey, and that was her impression. I just thought that was interesting from somebody uh, born in 1932. Um, but uh, um, I thought this time we had characters um, that were somewhat realistic and relatable, as opposed to the movies I mentioned before. I think that's about all I've got on this one. This is Cruz, uh, KI5KWG. Back to you, Nat. Reverend, 
even though he, his face was uh, shaken, I thought it was kind of interesting and fun how he came about, and, and then he gets hit with his own uh, uh, offering uh, um, pan uh, that looked like a, suspiciously like a flying saucer, and then suddenly he realized and put together that God had sent them to, uh, to help us. So that kind of, you know, I thought, it's all right. That might be something that might actually happen. Uh, certainly, one, one of the things, and let me digress a little bit, is that, you know, how does, how does would religion re, uh, act? And very much like he did, I suppose, uh, in a way, uh, to what would happen if they, we found life outside of Earth. How would that all play out when virtually every religion is Earth-centric? Uh, I mean, by, it's natural that it would be, right? And heaven is above, uh, maybe not in space, but not on earth. So when you bring in an element from the outside, that that kind of is going to make things a bit dicey for your your basic uh, reverend. And that's what happened with Ray, although Ray also had his own problems along the way. But I, I thought that that might have been an interesting thing to explore a little deeper. But there were so many characters. Maybe that was the issue. Maybe there were too many characters in this thing, and we had to kind of sort them all out. That might be what's happening here. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, it's hard to keep track of that many characters. I have trouble keeping track of two characters. Whenever you have this many people in a cast uh, and they're all fighting for screen time, you get a little bit here and a little bit there. You do get resolution. You get the, the folks staring off and and, and the, knowing that this is their, maybe their last days on Earth, that they're going to act in certain irrational ways, but very logical ways at the same time. Well, as well, this is the last time we're ever going to be able to do, be here as human beings and alive, which is kind of a a dark thought, but that's not how it, it played out, and the town showed its best or worst, but best worst that you could be with the, uh, the, the attack of the lactating machine, which was, or whatever that thing was called. It's not my fault. It wasn't my name. It's their name. Whatever it was that kind of blew up. Characters here to see. I can, some of these people I can't even remember. Uh, Cruz got it down. I hope he took notes or something because he, uh, he had all the characters down, which is quite amazing. Because I, I couldn't keep up with them. Of course, I fell asleep too. All right. Uh, that's all I'm going to say because I've already dug my own grave for the aliens to go ahead and cover over when they show up. Uh, let me ask, is there anyone else who would like to check in this evening? We're talking about Brave New Jersey. Please come and recall your name. And did you see the film? November 5, India, Mike, Sierra. JJ and Carrollton, and no, I did not see this fine film. Jersey that were affected by War of the Worlds, I would probably have thought that why am I wasting my time watching this when I could just watch Buckaroo Banzai in the Eighth Dimension again? You know, it's kind of somewhat in there, but Buckaroo had uh, you know, quite a bit more going to it from what I heard from downstairs when I was fixing the fridge and uh, listening uh, to the comments that I could get over my noise of pounding ice in the, in the fridge. It's in 5 IMS.
I agree with you. That's a better movie anyway. But what can you say? I'm eating ice cream, so I was hoping you'd go a little longer. So I had to swallow my ice cream, and I got an ice cream brain freeze thanks to you. But I did ask for your opinion on a movie you did not see. All right. We'll go to the third round. Looks like we're going to end a little early, but that's okay. Let's talk about special effects, music, uh, uh, set design, costumes, whatever the heck you want to talk about to fill in the last round. We'll start at the top with Sean, KB9SOK. Sean, anything you want to say or something you did not say You can even that you just thought of uh, based on comments? It's an open round, whatever you want to say, from KE5ICX. Yeah, this is KB9SOK. Well, for special effects, there, there really wasn't a lot of special effects. Um, had they actually been attacked by aliens, it might have been more interesting. We'd have some cool effects. Uh, but obviously, like you mentioned, this was probably a pretty low-budget film. Um, but they, they did spend some money. It looks maybe a little bit on costumes. It uh, looked authentic for the time. They did have some nice-looking old-timey radios they were listening to. So that, you know, that, that was a positive there. You know, they had the little town, uh, you know, and it, it did look like it's from that era. Um, the music, I, I don't remember a lot about the music other than the horrible song the guy wrote, uh, which means that probably the, the music did probably match the scenes because I really didn't notice it. So I, I guess that's a positive as well. Um, you know, the, the sound quality is good. I can hear the people okay. Uh, not a lot as far as any real sound effects. I guess we'd have a nice fireworks show at the end. That, that, you know, they spent a few bucks there. Um, it was amazing, though, there at the end of the film that, you know, when they the fire was going off and they were just shooting in the air and, and they were all running towards the farm for shooting. It's amazing the way I got hurt. <laughs> it looked like a lot, of, a lot of people just shoot blindly into the air. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, the, the little shop looked, you know, for the time. Um, you know, so they, they did all right on the set. Um I really don't have a lot to add about this film. I, I wish I could come up with something. Um, yeah, it was better than that the, the, the Titanic movie. I agree with that, that last one we watched. Um, I think Barbarella was actually better than this one. You know, at least it was, you know, it kept my attention. Uh, it was so weird. Um, but it was at least entertaining. You know, you, you know, and once again, this wasn't horrible, but it just was just kind of a slow-paced, uh, kind of basic comedy. Uh, or something you'd see on near prime time, regular TV, where they gotta be careful with the kind of humor. Uh, but I agree. I think somebody said earlier it would have been. Uh, I think they should have took the humor farther if they were gonna go for it. Go for it. You know. Um, I think they could have made this much much funnier and with maybe a little bit darker humor. Um, so yeah, I mean, either that or take it the other way. Show how you know realistically how people really would. You know, thinking, you know, if there was a national broadcast on TV today, if they made it look like we were being attacked, how would people act today? Uh, that might be an interesting story if they brought it up to modern times. And, you know, with the Internet and all that, it would be kind of hard to make people believe it because there's so many sources of news. But, uh, you know, I suppose if enough people got together and wanted to pull a hoax, uh, you know, how would people react today? That that might be interesting. Um yeah, I think I'm running out of things to say, so <laughs> I'll return it back to that. This is KB9, that's okay. All right, very good. Thank you, Sean. And yeah, part of the, uh, the first part, you probably heard it too, um, uh, when I did the, uh, the previous NAC, my, my whole thing was uh, the article that suggested that you had to stay in front of all the news. And everybody in the Everybody has some sort of a, a connection to uh, to the news and the instant communication. So in this day and age, somebody would have to, you know, stay on top of it constantly. And rumors would go everywhere, and you'd have to quell those rumors or somehow control them and prevent them from going crazy because your message would be totally lost on on, a, uh, on the mobs that would be out there. So... That is a very interesting question, I think. All right, let's see here. Where am I at? Uh, that would be number one. The number two would be J, KB5, BZWJ. Anything you want to say, go ahead. What do you think? Uh, special effects? Uh, 
uh, you can talk about music, you can talk about uh, costuming, I don't care, whatever you want, or something you want to pick up that you didn't talk about earlier that you uh, uh, were thinking about now. Uh, go ahead, Jay, from KE5ICX.
what Lula was just kind of faded into the story. So I don't have much to say about that. Now, I like the costumes. I like the 30s. I always love a good period piece, and I love costumes. Uh, the music was okay, also. Okay, back to that. wb 5 I think it would have been someone like Zira who had the uh, the clever idea. I think Dr. Zayas uh, was, was just too committed to the establishment. He'd have wanted to meet the Martians head on, although he certainly wouldn't have panicked the way the, uh, the humans out there in Radioland did. Uh, <laughs> it's really hard to say. Uh, I was, uh, yeah, uh, my, my mind was wandering, and I'd really stopped thinking about the movie. Uh, and, and you did remind me that I, I did miss this masterpiece, and, and here I am. I'm going to try to talk a little longer because you're eating something. I can see you on YouTube. You're eating ice cream or something, and it looks tasty. And I, I don't want you to have to stop eating if you're hungry. Uh, <laughs> I don't really know how much more I can say. Because Dr. Zayas was really the defender of the faith, and he would have told us that there was no life on Mars. And uh, I think it was really the younger and more flexible scientists who would have devised the clever response, while well, at the same time managing to mock the humans as they scampered about and, uh, and hooted and hollered and did silly things. Uh, at any rate, <laughs> I've run out of things to say completely. November Tango 5, Tango Mike, thank you for thinking of me. ice cream nonstop for 20 minutes and then showing a bowl still full of ice cream. That was truly an awesome trick you performed on the uh, feed here. Um, the only special effect uh, item I actually recall from the film was uh, was the dirt road. You know, it was just something I'd read about and went back and looked at a couple of scenes and thought that was neat. They, um, they actually trucked in a bunch of dirt and covered the uh, town's uh, parking lot up to give it the uh, 1930s uh, flavor of, uh, of uh, non-paved streets in an old town, and I thought that was kind of interesting. And I think I'm pretty much exhausted on uh, what I can do with this film. So KI5, KWG, enjoyed it again. Thank you. And back to you, Nat. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, I'm enjoying it quite a bit. All right, let's see here. My final comments. Oh, I, I, I thought that the film looked good. Uh, audio was great. Video, uh, the, the, the overall look of the film was good. I, I thought the costuming and all that. These are things that when you're doing a period piece have to be somewhat convincing, and I think that they did that quite well. I thought some of the characters reacted and acted maybe more contemporary than they should have, but uh, that's just a personal opinion. Overall, I thought it looked good. Sometimes when you watch period pieces, particularly from the 1970s, where everybody's got big, you know, long hair, and then in the 80s where they got big hair, uh, it, it has a tendency to it date itself immediately. It, it, it recalibrates the time, and you're kind of taken out of the moment. This one did not do that. I think that they held it quite well. The cow machine thing that they had was a bit of a, a, a reach, I thought, and it did not really play well, I, I, I think. While they did have such things, I, it never would have been like that. And certainly, certainly uh, it would have been in a barn. That would not work reliably in a barn. Uh, the whole idea was to make it up as, as it looked like a flying saucer was obviously the whole point of the thing, which, which kind of was a step too far, I think. But it, it didn't add that much, I guess, maybe to the ending a little bit. But eh, I think there could have been another way of doing it more convincingly. But that's just me. Uh, everything else about the film, I don't know. Overall, it worked. I thought it was interesting at the end when they did the long credits. They actually did run the camera. Usually they freeze frame after a while as the, the guy, people were walking off onto the road. They're still walking that road at the end of the credits. I know you turn the credits off and you said, that's enough, but I watch the, always watch the credits. You never know what you're going to miss. And nowadays, if you don't watch the credits, you sometimes miss a final scene that's always globbed onto the end. So people are already halfway home in their cars when, they're at the, when they go to the movie theater, and nobody watches the credits all the way to the end because now with streaming it just says, okay, you're bored, move on to the next thing. So you never get to see the end of the credits. But I do. I hit the button that overrides the skip and watch it. And they just kept on walking right to the very end when they went closed to, to black. Not that anybody cares, but just thought I'd mention that since it's anything we want to talk about. Okay, that's it. That's what I got. Does anybody have any final comments or final check-ins or anything at all before I announce next week's movie? Uh, please come out. 10-5 IMS. Just a couple of random comments, at least if I remember them all. Uh, in answer, my answer to uh, the question you gave Tony, who I think was the other one that had not seen this film, uh, was basically the Mars attacks thing, how they defeated the uh, Martians in that. They discovered that totally by accident because the, the kid's grandmother happened to be playing that music and uh, found that it made the Martian's head explode. So I suspect that uh, in that situation, you know, it wouldn't have required, uh, you know, scientific, you know, brain or what have you. It would just have been, uh, you know, some, some random thing that an observant person, you know, happened to catch to uh, defeat them. And that was, made to uh, defeat the aliens. And let me reset. And I'm trying to remember what the other one is, so I'm kind of stretching a little bit. But uh, let's see. Uh, oh, well, it, it, it's it gone from the mind. I'm sure I'll remember it as soon as you close the net. Just send five IMS back to you. that was in um, Mars Attacks that they find accidentally is called Indian Love Call. 
And I have the whole recording of the ori original with Jeanette McDonald and Nelson Head Eddie from the movie of the same name, which uh, I know all the words to, and I sing quite frequently at work, which causes people's heads to explode. So it really is, it works. Trust me on this thing, it does work. So if you ever get a chance, watch it. Now I know there's the other version, the country version that they do, but the original operetta piece is Indian Love Call. Uh, it has, it's the Canadian, it, 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 where Nelson Eddy plays a, a Canadian uh, Mountie. And there's even a scene with, uh, who is it, uh, Jimmy Stewart. Jimmy Stewart's about 12 years old in this thing, and he doesn't even have a speaking part in it. He's the brother that is brought to justice. Put him in handcuffs, put him in the sled, and send him on his merry way. That's it. Good movie. You gotta see it sometime. The, the totem tom tom number, not so good. Uh, I think there's plenty of people that would say that that's pretty embarrassing. But you gotta see it anyway with the giant drum. It's about five stories tall. No, it doesn't make any sense. But what does? No, I am not done with my ice cream. I'm getting notes that saying, are you still eating the ice cream? Yes, I'm still eating the ice cream. I still got a little bit left, and I'm going to finish it as soon as I name what the next week's movie will be. So here we go. Next week's movie is... I have to look for it again. I add it up, and then it, it's down again. Hold on. It's, it's, actually, it's actually one that people might want to see. Please stand by. We plan these up front, so you have to understand that. Next week's movie is Life Force from 1985. That'll be next week's movie. And then if you want to get ahead of the game, the next one after that will be Battle Beyond the Sun from 1962. I don't think we've seen that one. So, Life Force from 1985. If you uh, have the links up where you can find it, or you can just do uh, what I do most of the time is just stream, live stream, free science fiction movies, Life Force, and you'll find it. That's it. I'll uh, post all that stuff next week. We'll see you the same time, same bad time, same bad station next week. So I'm going to say bye-bye, bye bonds, and remember to learn the words to Indian Love Call, because you don't know when somebody's head needs to be exploded. See you later. This is KE5. I I'm closed. I'm closed. I'm clear, and the store is closed. If you got anything you want to say after after that, you may do so, and you may address me as not the NCS. See you guys. Bye. KU5 ICX clear. A5 ICX and 5 IMS. As expected, it finally popped back in the head. I figured it would, JJ. Tell us. Tell us all. Some of us are still listening. Well, I was thinking uh, a good example of how people react to, you know, scary situations comes from the movie Airplane. You've got, you know, the people screaming, jumping out of the windows and various things and, and just doing all kinds of things. Now, admittedly, they took it way over the top because it was a comedy, but, uh, you know, that would be my example of a, a good way to ex you know, have uh, this, this totally, totally uh, scared population you know, handling the situation, you know, just, just going crazy, jumping up and down and running around and just doing weird stuff that uh, they normally wouldn't. Uh, hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. The Send 5 IMS. Oh, you're so right. You know, people.
people do crazy things. But remember in a group, people do crazy things. Um, you know, the famous hold my beer is an example of that. But as you get older, you still do it. You just don't have somebody hold your beer. They, maybe that amusement. I don't know, whatever it is. And, and you get too old to do things crazy. So really what you end up doing is that you're in your car, and as soon as you see the crazy stuff, you roll up your window and you drive away discreetly. And you hope you didn't see anything that was illegal because then you'd be called as a witness. It's that simple. I tend to agree. I've got a, I got a shirt that says, never underestimate the, uh, you know, what will happen basically with, you know, large number of crazy people. This N5 IMS. Well, you realize you're in a good hobby to meet a lot of crazy people, or at least hear of a lot of crazy people. Amateur radio does bring its its uh, collection of very diverse personalities, all of which may not be totally stable. Plus, it uh, to a certain extent gives you the uh, the belief that you are anonymous when you say things. Forgetting that you have to give your call sign and from that they can trace who you are and all that other stuff. But, you know, leaving that aside, you know, you, you feel like at the moment when you're saying things that you're anonymous, so you might say things that you might uh, otherwise not, but, uh, you know, it, it's just the way things are, you know. One of the things that makes ham radio fun, too, is sent by IMS. that on one episode, Herman Munster did use his ham radio setup to talk to people. This is by Linus. Jackets, that's the first one I was telling you about. And the second one was called The Monsters on Maple 
Street, which of course has a double meaning there. And the poor guy, Jack Wesson, I think it was, who played the character, is the poor, unfortunate ham radio operator that gets blamed for everything. He's the guy that's talking to the aliens. Another alien episode that's unseen. Always the ham radio guys. They're always to blame. KE5 ICX. I tend to agree. After all, who gets blamed for all the uh, television interference? Just because you uh, put up a tower with an antenna, or you put up an antenna on your roof, what have you, and you haven't even got a radio yet, and your neighbors are banging on your door, why are you doing TV? What are you doing to my TV? Nothing. I don't have anything that I can do to your TV. <laughs> yeah, I put an antenna up, but the, the uh, radio's on back order. But I guess I'll better let you finish your ice cream, and we'll talk to you later. But I, I enjoyed uh, what I got of the uh, the discussion, and I hopefully got the refrigerator fixed. Uh, in a bit, I'll go downstairs and make sure that it's no longer pooling water in bad places. Talk to you later, Tom. 7-3, and 5 IMS.